everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. I am not going to take a lot of time getting into this because I want to cover some things in detail. But I do want to remind you, as I stated yesterday, that we are in the middle of a fundraiser boost for the remainder of the weekend. The goal is to raise $10,000 over the course of the weekend. If you believe in the work we do, you know the programs. Uh, our programs for battered women, uh, domestic violence, our programs for wraparound services for black men, mental health, a uh, black man lead rite of passage initiative, the research center, the think tank, advocating for young black males and juvenile system and on and on. If you believe in the work we do, uh, we definitely need your support. Uh, the goal again is $10,000 over the course of the weekend. Uh, look in the description box and choose the way that you want to support our work. I want to talk to you today about the disintegration of the black family nucleus and the war on black marriage and how it directly impacts our quest or our desire or our journey for black empowerment or the lack thereof. Uh, we're going to start uh, because the marriage is the foundation of the family. Uh, you have two individuals who come together who are to merge and sink in in focus, in purpose, in direction, in value for the purpose of creating a family environment and training the children in the children in the way of their particular value system, preparing them uh, to and empowering them to go out into a world that is inherently hostile towards them, to not only compete but to win. And over the course of time to develop an entire generation of youth who are capable of going out and securing a larger piece of this world to increase our influence, our, our power, and our ability to become autonomous. But it starts with the marriage. And those who oppose us understand this. Uh, there has been a focused an intentional agenda to disrupt the family nucleus and the way that it is being done is by creating separation dissension and disruption between the black man and the black woman uh, let me start with a disclaimer i am not here to say that we don't have issues we definitely have issues i'm not here to champion one cause over the other there are some things that i have held my brothers to the flame over for decades and there are things that i have called my beloved sisters out for for the same period Period of time. This isn't about pointing the finger of blame. This is about gaining a lucid perspicacity or understanding of what we're facing and why we're facing it and why it's important to look beyond the surface of what we see and feel to understand the, the minute, intricate man, uh, maneuvering and manipulation that is taking place and how it's impacting us. So I'm going to just start. We have to understand that despite not being able to legally establish families, to legally have the right to be with one woman and be with your children during slavery, when it was often common to sell off offspring or to sell off males or to sell off females to ensure that family bonding did not take place. Uh, we still found that after our emancipation, we were able to effectively create traditional family situations. Uh, they weren't perfect. Uh, it was coming from s some extremely imperfect and damaged people, but they were nevertheless functional and they served to allow us to grow, to expand, to build. We began to build enclaves and we began to own our own things. We owned our own theater companies. We owned our own cab companies. We owned our own bus companies. We were buying houses. Uh, we were starting to do the things that gave us a place in this world. Right around the time we decided that it was important to not just build our own, but be accepted by the power class, whites, um, during the, the beginning of the civil rights movement, there also began a movement uh, in opposition to the family, the black family. We went from 
a situation in 1960 where 75% plus of black children were born into two parent households to now um, most, I think it, it's over the last year or so to start to make a turn, but we're talking 75% born into single parent households. Um, and there are a number of different variables behind that, but there's also a constant push in even when we get married, we can't seem to stay married. And this is a disruption. So first I wanna talk about engineered separation. One of the ways that engineered separation started to take place is they started to redefine manhood on a social level, uh, using media, using uh, presentation, uh, the persona of men, especially black men, became more commodified. What do I mean by that? The sole purpose or the very focus of what a man was was based on his ability to take care of his home. Now, I am a firm believer that it's a man's responsibility to be a provider. It doesn't mean that the wife doesn't work. It means that it's his responsibility to make sure that the necessities in the home are met. Um, now, there are times when it gets tough. There are times when the two may have to come together, but it should always be his desire, his yearning, his point of purpose to get up every day and make it happen. But here's what happens. He's so much more than simply the provider of the roof, the provider of the food, the provider of running water and electricity. He is also the source of identity in the home. The woman is the nurturer. She is the one that would be the primary teacher early in life. But the sense of identity comes from the father. There's a reason that everyone takes on the name of the man in marriage and the children take on the name. There's a sense and source of identity that is biologically and spiritually present. And so it, it also functions in a legal capacity. But what happens is that's ignored. He provides a covering. He provides an environment outside of the physical space. He's providing an environment and his his state of mind, his state of being, his presence, his level of and the capacity to love and communicate. All of these things are part of what he brings to the table. And I'm going to talk to you a little later about the three P's. But what I will tell you is at the same time that the black man was being commodified, meaning that a great deal of emphasis was placed solely on whether or not he could pay the bills. Uh, we were also experiencing what we now call deindustrialization. What does that mean? Black men up until the 60s were able to take care of homes. Black women stayed at home just like white women for the most part. The black man was the provider. He was the dominant force in the work. He was the dominant president presence in the workforce for more men in the workforce than women. Women were at home uh, doing uh, different things on a domestic level, managing the home and doing things I think is immensely and extremely important. And the, the inability to effectively balance that now is also a problem. But what happened is the these men, black men were able to do this with Little, as little as a high school diploma and sometimes even less. My grandfather became a master welder with a second grade education uh, and made a good living and took care of us. My grandmother still owned her own beauty salon, so she wasn't just sitting at home. She was doing her thing and he supported her in it. And then when he retired from Dresser Clark uh, building all rigs, he turned around and started his own lawn service and janitorial service. Uh, so I, I, I was able to see what they were able to do, but that was just it. What happened is in deindustrialization de is they started to remove the plants. Uh, if you lived in the Midwest and North, they start to remove the car plants. They start to take them overseas. They start to put them in uh, different places. So then the warehouses and manufacturers start to move businesses. So they start to pull the jobs that black men could do and earn good livings out of the community and put them in distant places. So that left the what black man, what? Unemployed or underemployed, taking whatever jobs were left behind that did not allow him to fully do it. Simultaneously, something else happened. They opened the doors for matriculation for black women in the schools, opened the doors of black women into the workforce. And what happens is simple mathematics. Simple mathematics says if there are 100 jobs available and 80 black men have 
80 of those jobs and 20 black women have 20 of those jobs and all of a sudden those 60 of those jobs are now available to black women that means only 40 men have jobs that's 60 men who don't have a job we're just saying um and so then there is a problem uh, when you read the the negro family a case for national a action which became affectionately known as the uh monahan report what you will see is a warning by daniel patrick monahan to the johnson administration that doing just that was going to actually cause more damage and more harm to the black family than simply creating more jobs for black men and letting black men take care of their families bringing black women into academia and bringing black women into the workplace sounded great to black women and it was for them but it did a number on the dynamic for the family because now they're sending a message that this is what he's supposed to do for you but you can do that on your own or for those of you who aren't motivated to go do it we'll give you this we'll give you section eight we'll give you afdc we'll give you food stamps we'll give you all of these different things that he's supposed to be providing and you don't need them matter of fact in many instances you can't get this stuff if he's around now black men before we you go pumping your fish and saying see we had a responsibility to come together and make sure that didn't happen and we didn't do it. We had a responsibility to find a way to stay and we didn't fight hard enough. Uh, we have a responsibility as leaders to uh, impose our will on things and ensure that we we're where we're supposed to be. Sometimes protecting people means doing it without their permission. Sometimes protecting people means protecting them from, the, from, from their own selves. Sometimes you've got to be in uncomfortable positions. That's what being a leader, that's what being a king, that's what being a head is all about. So there's room to go around means. But, but the, needless to say, the deindustrialization took place. Then they took deindustrialization a, a little bit further. Black when I, back when I was going to school, you had what? shop in school you had auto mechanics in school you had these different vocations that you can learn that literally when you left school you had an entryway into a job as an apprentice to learn how to be uh, and earn good money those those uh, trades now earn six figures they get their hands dirty but they earn six figures whereas in they got a lot of emphasis on degrees where you're literally paying for the degree years after you've gotten it and you're not earning the money necessary to ever get ahead. That's another thing. So you've got these uh, imbalances, this mathematical equation that says when we allow women to come in and consume jobs. Now, there are more jobs. True. But there are more people. So what you're looking at is a growing population with a job market that is not growing at the rate of the population. And then an entry of a part of the population that historically had not been in the job market entering the job market, displacing people who had been in the job market, and then labeling them as lazy, labeling them as incapable, and putting a target on their back for not being able to do what they are being called to do, but it literally being an engineered uh, reality. Then let's talk about divorce rates. This is where it gets real interesting, and, and I want to talk about this is because this is how they've really gotten to us. Divorce rates in, in, in patterns. Uh, women file for divorce 75 to 90 percent of the time. It depends on how you categorize women. If you're talking about in general, 75 percent of divorces are filed for by women. If we're talking about women, educated women, women with degrees, uh, if you just take uh, marriages where there's a woman with a degree in the house, the rate goes up to 90 percent. It's almost always the woman that's filing for the divorce. And then there are all these different variables. And I don't want to marginalize anything that anybody is going through. This is not about convincing people to stay in situations where they are being abused, mishandled, mistreated, uh, disrespected in any way. This is about saying we need to be careful of what's driving our desire to leave. And what I want to talk about is what got me is whenever we start talking about um, divorce, especially when it comes to black women, uh, the the 
intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide things come comes up and it's definitely an issue i've spoken on it i'm an advocate for uh women who are victims of domestic uh, violence and i will continue to advocate i will continue to hold men accountable i will continue to push that we be more protective of our women because that's a part of our responsibility that we don't ever really truly embrace and that's because there's an attack on masculinity and i'm gonna talk about that a little bit later but we need to step into our responsibility to protect but in in in, in when you look at these divorce lakes i looked at the causes the top causes of divorce based on over 100 studies and you would think okay there's a big domestic violence abuse thing and if it's not that it's cheating and it used to be money and money is in this thing is here here's the thing lack of commitment just no real true commitment covenant doesn't mean what it used to marriage is no longer sacred marriage is a place you go when you don't you're no longer quote unquote happy and we're going to talk about how we define happiness and how the system has defined happiness for us to drive actual in unhappiness to a level we're constantly making decisions that don't support what our happiness and i'm, I'm, I'm going to get into that in just a second but lack of lack of commitment don't get along argue too much the, the inability to communicate and there's a reason behind it and it, it's being forced when once you become selfish it's almost impossible to communicate possibly because you're not communicating for understanding you're not communicating for the purpose of resolving issues you're communicating for the purpose of winning proving your point and getting what you want and i'm gonna tell you why that's important in a second but you go down and then infidelity is number three and the crazy thing is in the early parts of stages i found that while men are more likely overall in general to be uh to, to cheat uh from 30 down women are actually more likely to cheat and then as we age men cheat but here's the thing men are more likely to stay in relationships and so the dynamics within the relationship play a role in that women are bouncing and a big part of that is they're not happy and we're going to talk about why they're not happy and all of this stuff is, is is getting somewhere so but domestic violence here's the thing about domestic violence whether it's in the black community or not but let's just talk about domestic violence in the black community in intimate partner violence uh let's talk about it it happens almost equally so it turns out that 23 percent of domestic relationships have a male i mean a female who is the perpetrator of violence and 24 percent of domestic relationships have a female who is a perpetrator of violence where the disparity is distinct is in intimate partner homicide black men are far more likely to kill their uh intimate partner than black women uh but as far as the violence and the abuse it's almost equal that's something that um, when I first started to study this, that was interesting to me. There is normally a volatility uh, in there, but black men are definitely more likely to be the cause of death of their mates than black women are. And as a matter of fact, the leading cause of death for female, black females ages of 15 to 44 is inter intimate partner homicide, something we definitely need to look at. But it is number eight on the top 10. It's not even anywhere close in percentage points to lack of commitment, argue too much, infidelity, and a bunch of other things that actually can be worked out. So then what are we doing? We are literally basing uh, these decisions on some things. So let's talk about this thing because what you find when you actually start to talk to the women who are filing for this is I wasn't happy. And there's this big push that says, pursue your happiness at all point and i believe absolutely you deserve to be happy you should never be in a situation where you're unhappy my argument is happiness has been redefined to be unattainable happiness has been redefined to be unattainable and the pursuit of happiness in this false uh vacuum actually makes you more unhappy so the more you pursue happiness you uh, actually the more unhappy you become and i'm gonna explain to you how this works you have pleasure versus contentment, pleasure versus calm, versus peace, uh, an awareness of self and being in a place and understanding your purpose, your place and being content, not compliant, not complacent, 
content, meaning you understand all of these things and you found your space and you have you are at peace with yourself, with God in the world. You understand when you encounter things, you have the ability to overcome them and that you have the capacity to create things in your life that you desire. That is contentment. That's happiness. Pleasure, on the other side, is this thing you pursue that's directly associated with things. And here's how it works in the body and how the body interprets it and how the mind interprets what the body is doing. And both of these things come in two forms. Pleasure is directly associated with dopamine. Uh, contentment is directly associated with uh, serotonin, which is uh, what we would call... Um, A, both of them are actually uh, neurotransmitters, um, chemical neurotransmitters. And what does that mean? That means that they actually send signals uh, between neurons. They, uh, For instance, um, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that controls mood. Uh, what else? Mood, cognition, reward, learning, memory, all of that stuff. So everything that's developmental, and communicating it also controls stuff like uh what you vomit when you vomit that's uh, a serotonin response uh also uh vasoconstriction the constriction of arteries uh for certain purposes uh that's a, a serotonin response dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is a cytatory uh serotonin is inhibitory uh and that'll make sense in a minute uh, so dopamine, literally, as it communicates, it is a cytatory. So it literally excites the neuron. So when it fires and sends a message to the neuron, the neuron excites. The problem with this is that, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because if you look online now, if you look at what is being pushed to you by Madison Avenue, by Wall Street, by Silicon Valley, by Washington, D.C., by large business that and retailers that want to sell you stuff they've associated happiness with pleasure and matter of fact if you look at the definition of happiness you will often see it associated with pleasure the truth of the matter is they are very very distinctive they're actually produced by two different neurotransmitters happiness is produced by serotonin it, it brings a balanced consistent sustainable feeling it stabilizes your mood it gives you a sense of tranquility it gives you a sense of belonging uh, uh, uh dopamine on the other hand provides a sense of excitement now there are some things dopamine is a part of the motivation process it also ha happens to happen with some of the f physiological movements of the body as well but and it has its place here's the problem though when you're pursuing happiness as it's defined predominantly in society you're chasing things you want this, you want that, you want this in your wardrobe, you want to drive this type of car, you want to be able to go here. All these different things that you associate with happiness is excitatory. Here's the problem. As, it as uh, the dopamine triggers this uh, communication between neurons, it excites the neuron. The problem is the more excited a neuron is, over time, it begins to die. So the neuron and the self-defense mechanism starts to shut down neuroreceptors. What that means is there are fewer receptors to receive the message, fewer receptors to be excited. And what actually happens then is it takes more of the same thing to get the same feeling. Why? Because happiness has now become a feeling. Happiness isn't a feeling. It's a state. Most people will call it joy, but it's, 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 it's a part of happiness. And it's a part of fulfillment. But when we're talking dopamine, what's happening? I'm chasing something. I get a high. Okay, now I want, I want to feel that same thing because I'm associating that thing with happiness. This is why you get promiscuity. This is why you get gambling addiction. This is why you get drug addiction. This is why you can't stay in one relate. Why? Because you're chasing something. This is what happens. Okay. Dopamine triggers the, 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 the communication. Uh, the signal is sent from one neuron to another neuron. It excites the neuron. The neuron says, wait a minute, I'm getting too excited about this. I'm going to downregulate and shut off a number of my neuroreceptors. Now it takes more of the same thing to create the same feeling. And then again, it shuts down neuro, 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 more neuroreceptors. And what happens? It takes even more. And it gets to a point that now you're taking big, huge gobs of whatever it is to make you have that feeling and getting nothing. 
now you've built what we call, if you're talking about alcohol and drugs, tolerance. But it's tolerance in anything that you've been pursuing and using to create that feeling. Now you've got tolerance. Now as those neurons start to die because you've overexciting them, driving and pushing on one particular pursuit and not bringing the balance because balance comes in serotonin, but you are now killed it. What happens? Addiction. You're addicted to shopping. You're addicted to gambling. You're addic addicted to sex. You're addicted to drugs. Why? Because you were pursuing happiness in things. You're broke because you were pursuing happiness in things. Same things happen in marriage. I want, I want, I want, I want. But what happens is it also makes you what? Selfish. Because now the focus on happiness is about self. And see, it's about self and happiness doesn't. And there are several things that Dr. Uh, uh, man, I didn't write his name down, but I read his book and I don't have the book around here and it's not coming to me. But I definitely want to get him and put his name in the thing. But he identified seven things that are associated in distinctively understanding pleasure versus happiness. Pleasure, pleasure is short-lived. Happiness is, happiness is enduring. Pleasure is visceral. Happiness is ephemeral. Um, pleasure is um, taking. Uh, happiness is giving. Pleasure is achieved with substances. Happiness cannot be achieved with substance or material things. Happiness is a state and awareness of where you are it also is aware of where you can go. It is obtained through uh, uh, the neurotransmitter sent serotonin, which is by nature a neuroinhibitor, which means that it stops the excitement and it allows the what the nerve in, the nerve cells and the brain cells that are receiving the signal to do what to receive it in full, embody it, and not be overwhelmed by it. Now, there are times to get excited, but you, you can't go around expecting to be excited all the time. Imagine that, just thinking what, what it would be. I'm, I'm excited, excited all day long. You would burn yourself out, right? Well, that's what you're doing to your neuroreceptors, chasing things. But And when you start chasing things in a marriage and you're not chasing them together, then it really gets bad because what? You're blaming the other person for your happiness. Nobody's responsible for your happiness but you. It's a state of being. It's a state you can share your happiness, but nobody else can give it to you. See, people can give you things. People can make you excited. That's what Wall Street wants. That's what Madison Avenue wants. That's what Washington, D.C. wants. That's what Silicon, that's what all these people that are selling you all these, like, did you realize? They're talking about dopamine. Do you realize that every time you pick up your cell phone, you get a dopamine rush? You wonder why you can't put your phone down. You ever sit up and go to a restaurant nowadays and you got an entire family and everybody down to the two-year-old has a device and everybody's in their device. Nobody's communicating with each other. Why? Because the phone gives them the dopamine rush, the excitement, the feeling of whatever. And I guarantee you the phone did not give them the rush that it gave them initially. Same thing. That's the rush you get when you buy a car. But that's why two months later you don't get the same rush. So what happens in that sense? can't go out and buy a car every month unless you're just really truly extraordinarily rich so what you do you start trying to fill that space with other things that excite you you're trying to fill a space that cannot be consistently and constantly filled and now you're walking around saying you're unhappy here's the problem because serotonin is the true origin of contentment and happiness as you would define it throughout history but dopamine is the down regulator of serotonin large amounts of dopamine will decrease the production of serotonin so then what happens I'm chasing something to get a high I'm associating that with happiness but I the, the high that I'm getting is decreasing in impact each time I do it and I'm associating the diminishing effects and returns with being unhappy so then the more I chase it, the more unhappy I become. And then eventually I get to the point where I'm not happy here. And so I leave. I'm not happy at this job. So I leave. I'm not happy in this marriage. So I leave. And the truth of the matter is I misunderstood and I, re I focused my center and my energy and my efforts on creating excitement instead of stability and 
what 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 I did is n unsustainable. And so then we move into marriage as an institution. See, we talk about the children, we talk about the generations and and how the generation of this age, the millennials and the Gen Zs, how they are behaving and how they are so much different than we are. And what we don't realize is that the family structure, the family environment is where values, interests, and principles that align with what you want out of your life for you and your family, your progeny, your offspring, what you're projecting into the future beyond what you will live is is inculcated into the minds of your initial offspring in the home in the earlier developmental years. Before seven, children are in the state of theta almost all the time. That means they are downloading information. It's the best time to teach them. It's the best time to teach them about responsibility, about money, about what they are capable of doing, to teach them to dream, to teach them to reach, to teach them to expand. It is the best time. But it needs to be done in an environment where there are both masculine and feminine energies present. Why? Because they serve distinct purposes. You can sit up and you can emulate the actions of the other person, but you can't be the other person because physiologically you're built different. Women are neurologically different than men. Men, their brains, our brains work from what front to back. We are rewarded in our own mind. Our happiness, our serotonin is triggered by what? Accomplishment. Especially what we can do with our hands, the things we can create, the things we can fix. That's how women are intuitive. Brain moves from left to right. They're in their best moment when they are discerning, when they are feeling, when they are operating. And both of those play a role. Where? The man is the visionary. The man will see things in the woman she doesn't see in herself, while the woman will feel things in, about the man and discern things about the man he can't feel about himself. And both of these things create a what? A stronger power source. But when you divide us, when you turn us against one another, when the vitriol begins to pour, not only do we destroy ourselves, we destroy the future of the children. We are still procreating uh, and creating. It's not like we're saying, okay, we're not getting along. Let's kill it until we figure this out. We're bringing kids into the dysfunction without understanding the dynamic. And it's causing problems. We need to gain an understanding of it. So then the marriage is the foundation of the family. It is the source of the core values that are passed down. It is where our children develop character and strengthen integrity. It's where we strengthen the integrity of our character. Why? Because marriage is the one institution that causes you to step outside of yourself and see the need of another person. In many instances, more than you see what's going on with you, trusting that that other person will do the same for you. And when we operate fully in how we're supposed to operate, I'm supposed to have my wife's back caring more about what's going on with her internally than I do me because she's got me. That's the way it's supposed to be. But when you got it the way it is, it's about what I'm not getting. Why? Because everything out there is teaching what? Selfishness. And because we have equated happiness with pleasure, we're chasing pleasure which can't be constantly stimulated. You're killing off neurons. You're killing off the ability to get that excitement and eventually you can actually end up in a state of depression. So, again, we have to understand how the game is being played. It's being pushed. The more division they can create between the black men and the black woman, the more they can ensure that black children won't be reared properly. You can have all the love in the world. You can co-parent until you are blue in the face and be great at it. You will never produce the type of child you can produce with love in the home. And love has to be something more than you're making me feel excited. Love has to be something that is deeper rooted 
into what we are capable of doing together. It has to be connected to the overall vision. It has to be connected to the overall responsibility. One has to be outside of themselves to see the core power and force of marriage. If I'm inside of myself, I'm going to always be discontented because I'm going to be always called to give. And it can't be a tit for tat exchange. Sometimes I'm going to give more than I get because she's going to be in an incapacitated state, incapacitated state. She's going to be in a diminished capacity, diminished state. She's going to need rejuvenation. She's going to need support. She's going to need to be loved on, to be uh, admired, to be held, to be um spoken to with love and concern until she can rejuvenate, until she can recover, whether it's sickness, whether it's mental health, whether it's just simply having a bad day, she's going to need me to do that. And I may not be able to get it in return for her for a couple of days. And I've got to understand, it's not getting exactly in exchange what you give. That that doesn't work. In it's saying that I trust this enough that I'm going to give Knowing that when she's able, she'll return the love. She'll return the energy. She'll return the time and commitment that I'm giving. And then there are going to be times I don't have it. And she'll do the same for me when I don't have it to give. I'm just not feeling like it. The, the, the showing up, that's how marriages are sustained. When, when one person sits and says, well, if that's how you're going to do, then you go off and do this. Or, you know what, you know, screw this. And I'm going to go bounce and I'm going to go do this. Then it's only going to take so much of that before that's total disconnection total uh, disinterest, a lack of concern, a lack of love. And yeah, eventually that's headed down to the courthouse. And it, it's not by accident that in 1972, they changed the stipulations in most states on what the grounds for divorce could be. It used to be you had to prove up. It was called proving up a violation of the marriage vows. Infidelity, financial abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, uh, neglect, something had to be shown that the marriage vows were being violated to get a divorce. It was something, it wasn't, it wasn't as easy. And then they said, okay, let's make it simple. Let's make it easy. We want them to be able to break up. Uh, so it, it became insupportable, uh, insupportability or uh, irreconcilable differences. We don't get along. That's because you don't have to. You're two different people designed to think two different ways. Getting along is going to require work. It's going to require a commitment. It's going to require understanding. It's going to require grace. It's going to require some compromise and sacrifice of this. You don't get everything your way. But when you don't have to, when you can sit up and say, well, it's not working out for me. I'm out. Irreconcilable differences. Insupportability. I'm out. On to the next one. I'm not happy. And the problem is, there's a vacuum left. Broken home. Children try to marriage. And now, keep in mind, you've heard me talk and teach on adverse childhood experiences. ACEs, which is a tr uh, trauma in childhood. Now we understand that what? Parents breaking up is what? An ace. You've already given your kid an ace because you didn't want to commit to working on it. Now, again, this isn't about committing to being in something that's actually damaging you. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse. Any of those things. Infidelity. Any of those things. I'm not telling you to stay. But I'm saying you're not on the same page, find a way to get on the same page. Make the compromises and the sacrifice. It's about responsibility. It's about integrity. It's about being the best version that you can be. It's about understanding that you're never going to be better by yourself than you are synced with someone who makes the other side of your world better. You you talk about yin and yang. This, this is what it's about, feminine energy and masculine energy. Speaking of masculinity, that's a large assault on masculinity. You hear it talked, talked about all the time, toxic masculinity. The truth of the matter is that's absolutely Im culturally and vernacularly impossible to have toxic masculinity. Why? They are actually two diametrically opposing states of existence. Masculinity by its very definition and natural instinctive 
uh, push is protective, provisional, empowering, environmentally safe. It's everything that toxicity isn't. What they've done is take anything bad that a man does and label it as masculinity and put the word toxic in front of it. But what it is, is that type of behavior isn't masculinity. It's the absence of masculinity. It is the result of an attack on masculinity because there are not enough masculine men uh, modeling true manhood. That's why I created Black Men Lead. We need to socialize young black males into the true state of masculinity, understanding their responsibility and their role. We need to be more role aware. We are trying to uh, blur the lines of roles when in truth the roles have, have been there for a reason. Nobody is less than anybody else. Nobody is more than anybody else. Nobody's more powerful, but we have different roles trying to sit up and act and behave and push your way into somebody else's role or trying to control and tell them how to function in their role isn't your your place is to provide the environment you're supposed to provide by being in your role as a man i'm supposed to provide a secure environment where she feels safe where she feels comfortable where she can really truly explore the power of her spiritual prowess the thing that she is most exceptional at i need access to her spiritual womb but i cannot gain access to her spiritual womb if she's worried about the food in the refrigerator she's worried about the lights being turned off she's worried about the bills being paid the mortgage being paid the rent being paid she's worried about if they're going to come pick up the car at night now what we also have to understand in the demands we're placing on black men to be this and i believe we have to be this black man we're going to have to become more collaborative we're in last place we are the only race where our women make on median on a median scale Right about what we make. We make 44000 They make forty two, almost 43000 We're the only race where that we're that, that close. Now, here's the thing. As you move up in socioeconomic levels, they out-earn us. It's more of them having freedom in corporate America, moving around. There's more of them matriculating. There's nobody being educated at the rate of black women. And there's a reason. They understand. And I've, I've said this from the beginning, that we'll only get as high as our women can spiritually lift us, but we will only get as far as our men can physically lead us. If we uh, incapacitate the man economically, it doesn't matter what the woman does. They know this. No matter how much money she gets, she will never have a power in this culture, in this society. So then we have to keep the male hamstrung because he's the threat. Now, our women are mishandled, don't get me wrong. You know, it ain't like our women got it going on, and they, but they are put in a better position than us, purposely, so that the need for us is less. The disdain for us is more. Nothing like telling a woman, if you can do it, why can't he? It's, I mean, and on the surface, it's like, man, I'm not here doing it. What's your problem? Man, you probably got 15 letters before you left school saying, come here. I applied to 100 schools, got two. Couldn't afford to go to each. They gave you all kind of subsidization to get you into school. Got you out of school. You were uh, allowed to come into different places. And this isn't me complaining. I made my own way. And that's what I want to get black men to do. But what I'm trying to tell you, when you, when you sit up and you're in a structure and the infrastructure that is created says this is how you make it. And then they X you out of it and you don't have the wherewithal to say, if you X me out of this, I'll go find my own way. You're sitting there waiting and trying to figure out how to get in and feeling frustrated. And you got a bunch of frustrated black men out there that don't know how to manage their emotions because we haven't taught emotional uh, maturity. We haven't gave them a sense of self. And when you don't know who you are, this happens. This happens. It's our responsibility to return uh, the luster to black marriage. It's our responsibility to reestablish and rebuild and restore the black family and it starts with the black marriage it starts with coming to an understanding of who we are coming to an understanding of what true happiness and contentment is versus what uh, pleasure chasing and material chasing will do to you
you literally have been put in an environment that no matter what you get, no matter what you do, you're not happy. I've literally seen situations where people went into marriages and improved their situation drastically. But in improving their situation, they were exposed to things they hadn't been exposed to. It created that excitement, that dopamine rush. They wanted more, they wanted more. And when they felt like they couldn't get more there, they felt like they were being held back. They felt like they were being mistreated. I mean, I've seen it. You know, I do this. I work with couples. I work with people. I work with individuals who are coming out of situations. And so I see this a lot. And so, and it's not just in the black community, by the way. But my concern right now is for my people. So then here it is. What happens? He will more than likely cheat before he leaves. So he deals with his discontent because he's not happy. So it's not just women being manipulated. I want to be very clear. Men are being manipulated too. I'm not getting what I want. I'm not happy. So bam, I'm going to go cheat. Because she's going to tell me what you won't tell me. See, he's, he's searching for something different. She won't tell, she's going to tell me what you won't tell me. She'll do what I want her to do and, and you won't do. All this other bull crap that we convince ourselves to justify doing stuff that's absolutely totally destructive not to just our mate in our marriage but to ourselves we just don't see it and then that's what he did what she does instead of saying you know i'm done with this i can't do it i'm out she's gone and here's the problem though here's the problem if you look at our demographic if you look at our ages i'm really trying to get us to understand something and you start to look you'll start to see that at a certain age there's less marriage in the black community now she wants to find this guy because she's convinced that there's a guy out there that can keep that excitement going and so she's looking for that guy and she may be on the third or fourth guy because she's looking for that guy but here's the problem Every time a man goes through a divorce, it, uh, what it shows me, my research shows me that when a woman gets divorced, she wants to get remarried. But typically, when a man gets divorced, it kills his desire for marriage. And number one is, he normally leaves with less than he came in with. He normally leaves with a str strained relationship with his children because now the children are oftentimes used as weapons, all this other stuff that goes on. And even if all that is measured, he's just looking at it, it's not worth the risk, it's not worth the pain. Because men won't explain or express their pain, but that hurts. Take it from someone who knows, it hurts. It doesn't matter what's going on, if you're trying and you want something and, it, and, and, and you're that invested, it hurts. And this isn't the point of finger at anybody else, it's just saying it hurts. So I get it now, I was different. When I went through my situation, I was hurt, but I knew I wanted to be married again. Haven't started dating, not sure when I will, uh, because that part does bother me. The idea of having to get to know someone, having to invest all of that, and the idea that it still may not work again. It's like messing with my head. So I want to be married, but I don't want to build again. And so I've got to get past that before I ever really truly entertained someone and say hey let's make it happen it doesn't mean that it's not doesn't mean that it won't happen in a certain period it just means hey i'm good where i'm at i'm good doing what i'm doing until god places the person that needs to be in front of me in front of me uh, i'm not going out doing the dating thing just not going to do it thank you but on the flip side i love knowing i want to be married again so I'm not the typical man, though, because what my research shows me is men are less likely. So what does that mean? The older she gets in, in moving in this discontentment and saying, I don't want to be married, the less chance she has of being married the next time. So eventually it gets to where you've got all of these women in their 50s and their 60s that are single that have left situations they could have salvaged. And a bunch of men who are sitting around that need to be in marriages that are sitting up saying, nah, I'm not going to do it. And really missing on the unbelievable bliss that can be in that and the contentment because you were literally meant to be together. There's a reason why that's male and female. We weren't meant to be apart. We we're literally biologically designed to be connected to one another. And yet we've convinced ourselves and we've let a culture convince us. You can be it out there. And we've even convinced ourselves through a form of psychosis that we're good with it.
Oh, I'm good being single. You've convinced yourself of that because right now that's where you're at. But the truth of the matter is you're not at your best. And you can argue up and down. And I can show you scientifically, biologically, neurologically, sociologically, financially. You're not at your best single. But you're out there and you're being controlled by images and information being bombarded into your mentality and your mindset that's telling you to chase this thing that's impossible to sustain when that's not true happiness. And you see it all over and all mm -hmm. over. And it's the push. If you're not happy, leave. Well, you're just going to be consistently and constantly leaving. Because what you're chasing is not sustainable. Nobody can. And what eventually happens is you completely blow out your neurons and you end up addicted to something that doesn't even make you feel excited anymore. Man, I could go on and on and on uh, with this, but we have work to do. And it's our responsibility to do it. And I will fight to my last breath for black love it is so absolutely necessary uh with that being said as i said in the beginning we are in the middle of a fundraising boost for this weekend the goal is to hit ten thousand uh, dollars if you're familiar with the work if you have been around for the last 30 years the last 15 on social media uh i've shared with you the work we're doing we're advocating for children and juvenile. We're advocating for young black males and females in the judicial system. We're advocating for victims of domestic violence. We are working our mental health uh, situation, which is a major issue. There is an extreme spike in suicidal ideation, uh, suicide attempts, and successful suicides. There is a spike in depression, uh, where black women are the most likely to be depressed. Women are depressed more more than men, but there's a growing spike in black in depression in black men and there's a lot of reasons why and we need to deal with that and we are confronting that and i'm constantly furthering my research in understanding that i'm disseminating it in a number of different ways through publication through lectures uh, i've done a couple of workshops this year on adverse childhood experiences i hope to do a couple more uh, if you want to bring me out to wherever you're at to do a workshop on adverse childhood experiences and generational trauma and how it's impacting our communities, I would love to do that. But we have work to do. So, again, if you believe in what I'm doing, support it. Look in the description box and give. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I want to be.